The Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court of the State of Iowa. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now in session. Thank you. Please be seated. And good afternoon. We have uh, two cases that will be submitted. Uh, those cases are David Powers versus State of Iowa. The second case is in regard to the matter of seized property. That second case is now submitted to the court without an oral argument, and we'll hear the arguments in the Powers case. Mr. Simmons. May it please the court. Good afternoon. I've uh, been coming up here for oral arguments on a regular basis since 1982. No one sitting on this court was sitting on the Supreme Court in 1982. A lot of arguments in the Court of Appeals. No one sitting on that court today was on the Court of Appeals in 1982. I like to think I've outlasted everyone. Um, I got my first court appointment in the district court for a PCR in 1981. Since the early 1980s, the law in this state has changed drastically when it comes to criminal and PCR cases. And it has always changed for the good. The arc of justice has always been bending toward justice. I would invite each of you if you have not done so far. In fact, I would urge you to read the transcripts of the motion hearings in this case in their entirety. They're not that long. And if you read them, you will understand why when I sat in that courtroom up in Waterloo on a couple of occasions back in the summer of 2016, I felt like I had gone back to the early 1980s. And worse, the judge was not only assisting the prosecutor in defending against a PCR issue, he was doing the work for the prosecutor in defending against a PCR issue. The assistant county attorney wasn't doing much of anything else. Not much of anything. For the city and for the witness came in, were, in, were allowed to do the state's work. I want to start the discussion about this case today with a, with a little bit about the standards of review. Uh, because as I read my briefs a couple days ago, uh, it seemed I had not drawn a full and perfectly clarified picture of what the standards of review are here. In the first issue, the denial of the police reports, the denial of discovery, the standard is abuse of discretion. And that is the only standard. Um, the cases I cited on the standard, the, 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 the Wells Dairy case and Exotica Botanicals are, are not clear to me, and maybe I should have done research, uh, but they don't mention prejudice. It appears to me from reading those that there is a presumption of prejudice when discovery is unreasonably denied or that it's just not necessary to consider prejudice at all. I, I would assume there's a presumption of prejudice because uh, some discovery requests, though unreasonably denied, could make no difference to a case at all. Uh, on the second issue regarding the fairness of the hearing, both standards are in play. Abuse of discretion and a constitutional issue with a de novo review. Now, 
I don't think you have to reach the constitutional issue to decide that second issue about the fairness of the hearing. Because I think there are enough errors in the way, in the, way the judge went about conducting these hearings and actually calling these hearings. And when you think about prejudice from the denial uh, of a fair hearing for Mr. Powers, I don't think you have to really get into any really detailed constitutional analysis. It's clearly unfair, um, and it's easy to reach that conclusion. The two issues are, are, twite, are, are tightly intertwined, and, and, and that is because of the factual procedural nature of the case. On the one hand, in denying the discovery of the police reports for no particular reason uh, that's recognized in the rules of discovery, uh, you know, there's, there's not a claim of unduly burdensome uh, or unable to access electronic documents or other documents. There's no claim of privilege. There's no uh, claim of investigative confidentiality that we get in criminal cases. There's nothing like any of that put forward uh, by the state or by the by the judge. Let me ask you a question, Mr. Simmons. If there's no claim of privilege, and I think your position is it's a public record under the Open Records Act, did you serve an open records request? I did not. Uh, Why not? I did not because I think that the process through the deuces tecum is much more expedient. Um, and, and I thought that it was important to have an officer from that department bring those reports into court to support my position in front of the judge. Um, I, I wasn't interested in bureaucratic or administrative entanglements in, in attempting to get these reports. They're not confidential records. They're germane to my issue, and, and I think the deuces take them was the most efficient way to do that. The issues are so tightly intertwined because the judge then made those police reports the ultimate basis for his ruling on the admissibility of the evidence as it would come in at trial without allowing Mr. Powers or me, his attorney, to see those reports. So first we deny discovery and then we deny the use of the reports in making the case uh, for the admissibility of false accusation do, evidence. Do we have to decide both issues or could we sort of bif take one step at a time? Uh, if hypothetically we, we held you were entitled to discovery, stop there, send it back for new proceedings once you see what's in them? Um, well, I guess we, you could do it that way and then I would after I got the reports and maybe did some more discovery that the reports may lead to, I could file a motion to reconsider the ruling on admissibility. Uh, of course, I would prefer that that ruling just be <laughs> reversed and, and we start over at square one, but you know, that's, that's the way I would do that. And you know, the reason I, I raised this uh, motion for admissibility is because I had agreed that the witness did not have to appear at the post-conviction trial in June of 16 and uh, agreed to a continuance of the trial. And it was just because the witness was going on vacation at that time. That's the only thing that was raised in the motion to quash. But after I agreed to the continuance, I get the order and the continuance also sets the case for a hearing on the motion to quash. And after that motion hearing, then the new trial scheduling conference was going to take place. Well, <laughs> I thought it might be just a mistake, um, 
waited for any uh, filings that I thought there would be more filings from the state uh, to, to quash the subpoena of, of the original complaining witness on other grounds. Never happened. Uh, so I filed this because I wanted to frame the issue on this witness for the judge when we got to this hearing. I did point out that the motion to quash is moot. I had agreed to the continuance uh, on the only basis they raised. So uh, any seasoned trial attorney, I think, is going to say, well, this motion to quash is going forward, so there may be other grounds coming up. And I didn't want the grounds to come up at the hearing. Uh, so again, uh, that's why I raised that motion now. Now, the, uh, the state has argued that was a self-inflicted wound on my part. Um, I guess it would be a self-inflictive wound if it would have been reasonable for me to assume that the judge would not allow me to see these police reports, or I had assumed that the judge would then use the police reports that I was not able to see to reach his ruling on the motion and to ultimately reach the merits of that particular issue in, in what amounted to a summary dismissal of the issue. Assumed all those things would happen, I guess it would be a self-inflicted wound. But what I was doing was framing the issue in regard to this witness and then attempting to bring in some evidence to show the judge uh, the basis for the issue. How, how, how um, as a proponent of the discovery, you would have the burden to show relevance, um, but how is it relevant uh, what happens after the trial is, you know, is over? Well, that, that, gets into <laughs> that gets into a pretty interesting area that should have been litigated in the district court. And I don't think the court needs to reach that question. Uh, but the point is, because these false accusations took place between the time of the verdict of guilt, but before sentencing, it came up within the time that a motion for new trial could have been litigated. Now, I can't tell you exactly what that motion would have looked like because I just don't have the full facts of, of, of the police investigation. Um, well, that's why I think the, what Justice Waterman indicated, it, it doesn't seem like it's fair to expect that we're going to make a decision about the admissibility of all these records either at this point when you haven't even seen them and no one has really effectively argued that as well. Uh, once you have an opportunity to look through those documents, then you're going to be better able to frame whether you can even, first of all, get them into the record, and even assuming that you get them into the record, whether or not you know, you've met your, your burden under the PCR. So wouldn't you agree that needs to be somebody, the, the district court judge, who's going to look at this information hear the uh, arguments because the underlying proceedings, at least as far as I could tell, really argued about whether you get them or not. I mean, that was the crux of it. And then I think Judge Stigler then went ahead and made a decision on your admissibility, but I, I just think that's where the abuse of discretion may have been uh, with regard to the, the second aspect. Correct. And that's generally with the trial then being set somewhere off in the distance, that's generally long before I would file a motion for admissibility. But it was just to frame the issue. And the thing is with the motion for admissibility, uh, if you continue to find more evidence, then you can always move to reconsider the motion for admissibility, even during the trial. Um, the thing that was key about the reports is not just the reports themselves, because the standard is, you know, could the information rationally and logically read to admissible evidence in a trial? Uh, there are names in there, and there are stories that people told. Uh, 
that may lead to other witnesses, may lead us to the witnesses. We don't know who those witnesses were. That's uh, why I'm saying it's a, it's a little premature to have uh, us or even have a hearing on that until you've had an opportunity to review those documents, perhaps do additional discovery on that, then have a hearing about whether it's going to be admissible or not. Wouldn't you agree? I would agree. And, I, and, and actually, I told the judge, I think it was that I thought at that point it was premature for him to rule uh, and that I should be allowed to do more, get the reports and do more discovery be before we litigate the, the motion for admissibility. Thank you. Mr. Simmons, thank you as well. Mr. Hansen. Good afternoon, may it please the court. Uh, today the court should affirm because the discovery rules do not permit fishing expeditions through irrelevant police reports. Uh, we have to start with the burden on the person seeking discovery to show that there is some relevance to these police reports. Well, it's even lower than that. It's reasonably calculated to lead to discoverable evidence. And if you have a couple police officers who uh, Mr. Simmons wants to, to depose or inquire about what was said by whom, when, related to the credibility of a witness, the police reports would be extremely helpful in conducting that analysis. I mean, it's a little bit like, I mean, it's been years since I've been in private practice. You always send out the request for production of documents first. Uh, you, you wouldn't depose a medical witness without the medical records ordinarily. Um, if he's interested in inquiring of these police officers, anything about the investigation related to KP and so forth, he's, he really wants to have these records. So, I mean, the, the, it's really the lowest threshold possible. Is it reasonably calculated to lead to discoverable evidence? And isn't our standard awfully generous on that? Well, relevance in this case. Calculated to lead to. Right, yeah, I, I'm, I'll get to that point. Relevance requires the victim's report to be false. And the district court looked through all of the records, said there's nothing here indicating her reports were false. Why can't the defense attorney look through there and say, because on the, in Heemstra, we had a case where the court went through the whole record and said there's nothing in here that would help the defendant. We had the case on appeal. We looked through the records and came to a different conclusion ordered the records released, and then the, the man got a new trial. I mean, why, why should the court be involved in the discovery of a case uh, when you're dealing with non-confidential information? Because we're dealing with a, a whole structure, and it's, it's a structure that is in every case where you try to discredit the witnesses against you, but it's taken to a different degree in sex abuse cases where defendants who are charged with these crimes do everything they can to embarrass and annoy the but victims. But you have the rape shield law to protect those people. And we've already decided, I think it's Baker, <coughs> that uh, other testimony or other false, I'm sorry, testimony of other false accusations of sexual abuse are not covered by the rape shield law. And that cycles right back into the relevance here and he, there has to be something indicating these are false or that there's something in the reports that is going to lead to a, a finding that they're How false. How does Mr. Simmons know that he never got to see him? Because he, he told the district court what he thought the reports contained. The district court looked through them, found nothing even remotely close. Same thing happened in Heemstra. We reversed. And if this court, I, I believe the records, the police reports are on file in this court. And if this court wants to look through them and see if the district court was wrong about that assessment, that's certainly something that it can do. Well, yeah, what, so he asked, what he asked for, I think, in the underlying motion on admissibility is, and I think he mentioned it just briefly at the, at the council table here, is, or at the podium, is that he wanted the names of these other people. We're not that interested in whether it's true or false, and, but he doesn't even know what the basic underlying facts are there's three other witnesses that there's names of people in there 
And that's what he asked for at the outset. And that's what he uh, repeated again today at the podium. And so this is different than what, what you're referring to, isn't it? Different from what? He's asking for the names that will lead, that could potentially lead to other information regarding the underlying criminal offenses. Uh, and we already know that there's a, a strong uh, evidence of impeachment evidence that might be there. Maybe he's looking for additional impeachment evidence that might have been there or available through the names of these other people. I mean, the, it, it's not just a fishing expedition. It's looking at these things and to explore it. Whether it's ultimately admissible, maybe not. Maybe it gets thrown out later on, but isn't he entitled to at least see it? Well, I have a two-part answer, so hopefully I can get at both parts of it. Um, First is uh, this idea that he's going to find other witnesses who might or might not have something to say a about the victim's story. And ultimately when we're in the, the PCR case where he has to prove the elements of new discovered evidence, what the fourth one is that it is evidence that would likely change the result of trial. And here- But, that, but, but that's, that's down the road. I mean, that's a separate burden from just talking about discovery. Uh, that, that's, he, he knows he's got the, oh, the burden down the road of showing that there was a breach of the duty and then the, there was prejudice that resulted in it. That's, that's a long way down the road. We're just talking about whether he can even come up with any type of information that might assist him in the PCR. But it, it, it's relevant. It, what is that trial gonna look like? If he, gets a, if he wins his PCR and he gets a new trial on the criminal the charges against Mr. Powers, what's it gonna look like? We're gonna have the victim come in and say, no, I, I, I'm telling the truth about my grandpa, I'm telling the truth about these gang members, and then these other witnesses who supposedly have discoverable information, we're gonna parade them in and, and try to counter what the victim said, and it, it all gets completely derailed from a, a question of Mr. Powers' guilt into a question of whether the that's subsequent a, that sounds like a 403, Rule 403 type determination down the road. Here, here's, here's where I'm having a little trouble. Uh, having read the state's brief, I'm not really sure what the state's position is. If the state's position is uh, uh, events that happen subsequent to the trial uh, that might bear upon the victim's credibility are just irrelevant and are not newly discovered evidence and are off limits then I, I can understand it because that's kind of a clear absolute and then the evidence, you know, the subpoena would not be seeking uh, evidence that's uh, relevant to the subject matter of the action. But if your argument is, well, after discovered, uh, events that occur after the trial might be relevant under some circumstances, although it's a high threshold, then how does, how does Mr. Simmons litigate that issue without the evidence himself, have, without having it himself. Well, he, he does what he did here, and he, he brought forth his witness who said what he thought the police reports contained. He had the court do an in-camera review and, and find it. But I would stress that the state is advancing that these records are irrelevant because the very theory of newly discovered evidence he's going under is not a valid theory because it's something that happened after trial and that, by definition, is not newly discovered evidence. How was the state harmed if, if we ordered, if we ruled that uh, he was entitled to see those police reports? I, I don't think it's really so much the, what the state is harmed by. I, I mean, the, the physical act of producing the papers is not what's going on here. It, what we're talking about is the, the secondary victimization to this sexual abuse victim. And having a process where apparently forever now, every time she does something or says something that could reasonably be questioned about her credibility, there's a fear that, that maybe her records are gonna be subpoenaed for another PCR. Well, there is a greater connection here because you do have two you know, sex offenses. I mean, they're, they're pretty related when it talks about the subject matter. Not every time that she may 
tell a lie or white lie something else that that's newly discovered evidence that we can try to use to attack her credibility. But these are pretty specific and pretty related types of instances, aren't they? Or allegations. I disagree that they are related at all. And it does not make sense to say that if unfortunately this young woman is ever assaulted again in the future, that Mr. Powers gets another PCR, gets another opportunity to trudge through the, the records of those subsequent cases. Well, what if in the police report there's a name listed who's a gang member, I, and I have no idea what's in the police reports, but obviously, um, um, but I will, I will take a look at them. Um, but supposing there's a name and Mr. Simmons pursues it and says, yeah, she, she said she was gonna lie about the gang members. Um, she told me that, just like she lied against her grandpa. Oh, Mr. Simmons is gonna investigate, he's gonna, he's gonna get a hold of some names and he's probably gonna kind of spade it up. I mean, that might happen. I mean, it might, is it reasonably calculated to lead to discoverable evidence? I mean, we don't know, well, that just hasn't been developed. It, I, it may be a dead end as you suggest, I disagree that that is reasonably calculated to lead to discoverable evidence. And well, let me ask prior cases you know. say you have to have a good faith, reasonable basis to believe that the records will lead to something like that. Let me ask and you this question. This is a somewhat different question. But if he could show that, that um, KP lied about the gang members, and this is going back, I think, a little bit to what Justice Mansfield was asking, but if, if he could show that she lied, um, is that totally, absolutely inadmissible in a PCR action? It is not newly discovered evidence because it was not in existence at the time of the trial. Okay, so and there's KP, only one if, exception to if it KP, for an utter failure of justice. If KP after the trial admits that she lied, that's not admissible? No. Might be different, right? I mean, because that if she, then if she's she talking that she about, lied about Mr. Powers. That's a different situation than that she lied about something that happened afterwards. after. The, here, the events didn't even happen. That's where I'm questioning. It's like, you know, I that argument I, it may or may not be right, but at least it, for me, it has the possibility of persuading me. The argument that just you know, Mr. Simmons has to trust the in camera review, that one kind of leaves me a little bit cold if you, you see where I'm coming from. But we have to, we, I don't think this court wants to, to create the perception to victims that they should not seek refuge in the criminal justice system. On that, on that note, um, well after Heemstra and after the legislative uh, action to protect mental health records, we held in State v. Thompson that uh, uh, in-camera review by the court that 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 was constitutional. We rejected an argument that the de criminal defense lawyer had to see them and it was a violation of due process. So does that case help you here to defend the in-camera yeah, aspect? Yeah, and I, I have cited the Thompson case in, in my brief um, for the proposition that it's not only the defense attorney who can look through the records and see if there's something relevant. If there's a good faith belief that the records contain something, Defense counsel can articulate that to the court and trust that the court will find it. What about I here, correct me if I'm wrong, but here, let's see, the uh, counsel for KP had all these reports. The county attorney had all these reports. The judge had all these reports and did his in-camera inspection. Isn't there something that seems fundamentally flawed with the idea then that the counsel for the defendant or for the applicant here in the PCR action can't have access to these records? No, it doesn't bother me at all because that's every discovery dispute where one party has the discovery, the other party is seeking the discovery and that party seeking the discovery is never going to have it. And this idea that the, the person seeking discovery somehow gets de facto discovery to litigate the discovery issue is just, it's mixing the whole thing up. Mr. Hansen, is, uh, is Mr. Simmons correct that he could, he, it, it would be separate records request anyway, an open records request anyway? I think you could make that request, but um, chapter 22 has a, it's not a completely similar provision, but it has a protective measure in there that a person 
affected by the disclosure can seek an injunction from disclosure. And I think that would operate very much the same way that uh, in this case, they sought a protective order from disclosure of discovery. Um, KP could go in if there's a discovery request and seek an injunction uh, to prevent that disclosure. But if he wants to make that- an injunction, they'd still have to, they'd have, a, have to have a basis under the statute for it, right? Would they have a basis, would she have a basis under the statute? I think that's a question that needs to be litigated if Mr. Powers takes that step of requesting an open records law. But here we're talking about the discovery, not the open records. So that's a question for another day. So because the discovery rules do not uh, permit uh, discovery of irrelevant information and more importantly, information that is going to result in re-victimizing this victim, uh, the district court did not abuse its discretion and this court should affirm. Thank you. Mr. Hansen, thank you. Mr. Simmons, rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Somewhere in one of those two hearings, I think it was the first one, I said, you know, my experience has always been if I want something from the prosecutor and it's not harmful to the prosecutor's case, they give it to me. Uh, and when everybody had these reports, and don't forget the city attorney had them too, and <laughs> he was litigating relevance. When everybody has those reports, but they won't turn them over to me, it seems to me there must be something in there that's going to lead to admissible evidence. That's just the feeling I got. Uh, Mr. Hansen says the physical act of producing the paper is not the real issue here. So why didn't they at least let me look at them? I mean, why couldn't they be filed under seal and I would still have access to them? What, what, what are we hiding? I have no idea. Uh, in regard to a motion for new trial, it's, it's and, and Mr. Hansen mentioned an utter failure of justice as the standard for a new trial. Also, that last subsection of the motion for new trial in the criminal rules says, if the trial was for any other reason impartial or unfair. Now that's, that's kind of a big catch-all. Uh, I don't think there's been a really closely defined case uh, from this court as to, as to what that might encompass. Uh, but as Justice Apple said, what if I get evidence that shows she admitted she lied in that trial? Would there be no recourse between verdict and sentencing if the defense could bring in a witness who said the complaining witness admitted lying? As I, as I understand the other acts, because this would be another act, it's not bad acts, it's other acts, they don't have to occur before the first act, they can occur after the act and still be admissible. I think we have some cases that say that. There is. And is that what you were trying to, to flush out there? Well, I mean, yeah, if you're going to get into the question about discovery of new evidence, does it have to be existing at the time of trial and that sort of thing, I, I think it, it falls in there somewhere. But I, I, I think uh, it, in, that, in that framework between the verdict and the sentencing, if a judge, the trial judge who heard the case, saw good, credible evidence that she admitted she lied about everything. I, I can't see any <laughs> trial judge in this state not granting a new trial. Um, and you know, and presented with the, the evidence, these witnesses often break down or recant and said, well, yes, I did lie about it. So what about, you talk about during the, in between the time of the, of the conviction and the sentence, but it's my understanding that the actual report was actually issued uh, deciding that they aren't going to press any charges in this case was actually done on in May, which was after the time of the sentencing. How does that impact? I mean, that not that something that can be argued later on uh, because it, it really doesn't have the same urgency that you may think. The investigation was occurring during that time, but there was no 
final decision made on the investigation. It was still ongoing at the time that he was sentenced. And then two or three weeks later, then they closed the file. Well, I mean, that, that's an argument later right. on, isn't it? So that's not dispositive of Well, that gets into one. other questions. Uh, and I still don't know whether it was ineffective assistance at counsel why this didn't come to light at the time, or it was suppression of exculpatory evidence. Uh, if, the, if the defense had been told about this investigation, the sentencing could have been continued. But that's the problem. I mean, Phil Powers knew this was going on, but he testified in the hearing. He, he doesn't think he told the defense attorney about it. Um, you know, he was not the defendant. And so, you know, what has happened here, keep this in mind, when you talk about something fundamentally wrong with the hearing on the admissibility, the judge, in the end, has dismissed Phil Powers as a witness on credibility, what he calls a credibility issue, and then he dismisses Detective Chopard because he says Detective Chopard has no business deciding whether he believes a complaint. Well, <laughs> if that were the standard, should the police file every false complaint that comes along and let the courts work that out and let the false arrest plaintiff's attorneys have, <laughs> have their day in court with all of those cases? Uh, of course it is the job of the investigator the guy who actually did the investigation, the guy who actually talked to all of the witnesses, including KP twice, of course that is his job. And what the judge did there, what is fundamentally wrong, and, and whether you wanna go through a constitutional due process analysis on that or not, what is fundamentally wrong and so plain is the judge ended up making his decision on the reports alone. And he supplanted his own judgment for credibility to KP for the judgment the investigating officer had exercised. And, and that's, and that, I mean, that illustrates the fundamental unfairness of the, of the motion hearing on on admissibility more than anything else, I think. If there are no other questions, I'll stop. Thank you. Mr. Simmons, thank you. Mr. Hansen, thank you. The case of Powers versus State is now then submitted and the bailiff may adjourn. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now adjourned.